afternoon. How's it going? Christine's going to the Derby. I love it. It's a hot kind of day. It is indeed. <clears throat> I was just thinking how hot I am in this room. <sighs> All righty. So <clears throat> I guess only, only nine of us made it from last week to this week, huh? That's okay. The important people are here. So let's, uh, I promised myself that I would not start off on tangents and get right to business because um, we only have two sessions left and we have to get through uh, all of our buyer uh, content. However, we did have a session with uh, Via Williams earlier today and I wanted to just take a minute or two and just uh, ask you for any ahas that you had, any thoughts that you wanted to share from, from that session. What'd you learn? What'd you hear from, uh, from Via earlier today? The intention of every up and house, you know, going in with that intent of, you know, getting at least one or two appointments from the people at the open house and that being the goal. Yeah, so, so crystal clear, right? And I, I can tell yeah. you that that, uh, you know, she, she was coached by Ben for a while and that is so Ben Kinney, right? Uh, if you know Ben Kinney at all, Ben is all about like, stop, stop searching for leads. Like that, that doesn't, that doesn't do much for you. Instead, search for appointments, even, even in places that you typically look for leads, search for appointments and bam, your, your, your mindset around that shifts. Because remember, you, you end up finding what you seek, right? If you keep telling yourself you're looking for leads, you're going to get a big long list of names that you consider leads. If you tell yourself you're looking for appointments, that's what you'll find and you'll start to behave differently based on the things you tell yourself. So yeah, that was one of my big takeaways too, Christine. Thank you for sharing that. What else? Sure. Well, I think I need to be much more focused, you know, and uh, and follow up. I mean, that to me that was a real eye opener, to be much more, you know, focused. Yeah, and and uh, and I would say, Karen, I, I call that on purpose, right? Just being on purpose. Right, because I, I loved I loved what Via said is that um, conversion typically happens at about seven contacts, and yeah. most agents give up after two, maybe three if you're if you're feeling aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. So that, so it's crazy. I mean, when you think about seven seven con how many of us are willing to ask for the close, ask for the business seven times? before we move on. <clears throat> big time, big time uh, difference. All right, so from now on, I'm only gonna talk to Nancy Mamby because Nancy Mamby is the only person left on camera. So for those of you who turned your cameras off, it's now time to turn your cameras on or I'm just gonna have a private conversation with Nancy. I'm gonna shoot down. She and I are gonna go out to dinner and the rest of you are gonna be wondering what it was the content today don't know because the content for Nancy and I was a drink and some burgers or whatever. There we go. We and didn't turn off. I didn't turn off my camera. Ah, are you on your phone? No. Oh, that's weird. Because <clears throat> all of a sudden you were gone. It's like, where's the hat? <laughs> that's weird. Any, anything else from, uh, from Via? Those are two really good ones. Let's have one more. Stuart. Yes, Rick. Um, what I got out of it. client because that attention span in which they remember you and then they forget you and then you call them three days later they're like who the hell are you so the response time yeah speed to the lead right speed to the lead that is key in our industry and it's far faster than what we think we think it's being annoying to contact them within the hour after the open house they they think it's efficiency right so be careful about how you interpret that Nancy, did you have one? I saw you unmuted as well. Yeah, the only the only other comment that I had that I you know jotted down was systematizing, uh, and the need to run your business with systems in place so that basically things don't fall through the cracks and you're you're always on on your game. Yeah, yeah, no, one hundred and ten percent. And I'm going to tell you guys, it's that is it's a constant 
constant battle, right? To continue to have systems that are bigger than where you currently are. And, and I, I say that to you because I, I, mean, I, I personally still struggle with that, with that today, right? Um, I mean, th th there are things that, there are things in, in, and just being transparent, there are things in, in my businesses today that I know need to be adapted to a brokerage with 550 real estate agents because they're, they, haven't, they haven't shifted from having 250 or 200 real estate agents, right? And so, so we're behind and we've got to continue to move. And the, 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 the challenge is not to move from, from having no system to having a system that helps you where you are. The challenge is, is moving from, from no system to a system that brings you where you want to be. So it's like you almost have to leap over where you currently are. Which, which, is, which is not intuitive for many people, right? You're, you sell 20 houses a year. You don't need systems to help you sell 20 houses a year. You need to build systems to help you sell 40 houses a year or 50 houses a year that will pull the 20 through because frankly, if you're selling 20 without systems, you could easily, easily be selling 30 or 35 with systems, right? So it's, so it's a matter of leapfrogging over where you are. I, I love that aha because it's a it's a it's such a real um, it's such a real uh, state for most of us, right? Let, let's face it: as real estate agents, most of us are not naturally good at the systems portion of it, right? That's why we're salespeople because we're naturally good at the other things that allow us to close the business, but we're not naturally good at the system stuff. And so that's where either taking time away from working. Um, in the business and focusing on working just on the business comes in or recognizing that if that's just not your skill set, just, just give it away. Just give it away. I, I pay for more things today than I ever have in my entire life. And it has nothing, it has, that, it's not a comment on disposable income or, or responsible spending. It's a comment on the only way to get things done the, as quickly as they need to get done to be beneficial to you is to not have to worry about it yourself if it's not a strength of yours and give it to someone who does have that strength because it happens in two hours instead of you worrying about it for three weeks and it's still not getting done, right? Yeah, that was a loaded one, Nancy. Thank you. Donna. Um, yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Just building off of the systems piece because you know, that is so critical. And while you're <clears throat> building those systems that'll lead you to a bigger business, also building those systems so you could pass that those pieces off to people on your team as you build the team. That's critical too. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, like remember a bigger business. Uh, what Don is um, mentioning is the other the other side of scale, right? Because scale can be one of two things. It's either you going bigger or you beginning to leverage at a really high level so that, so that you actually start to go smaller if that's what your choice is yeah. and, your, and your people start to do the do, the do right? There's, there's two different versions of, uh, of that. And one of them, <clears throat> I, I constantly have Gary in my head around that uh, concept and uh, what he, what he yeah. told us, yeah, right? What he told us a million years ago is, you know, do you want to build it as big as you can build it? Or do you want to build it as big as it can be built? What's the difference? Right? The second one takes the you out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Do you want to build it as big as you can build it? Or do you want to build it as big as it can be built? And that second subversion, there's not a you in there. And that's the, that's the place we get tripped up, right? Is thinking this business has anything to do with us. <clears throat> I know I've, I've tripped over that multiple times, right? And then I got to learn the exact opposite. And for any, any of you who are at that point and, are, and struggle the way I did in your head about how, how do I grow and not, and not have the communication with everybody? How do I grow and not have my hand in everything? How do I grow and not have to touch every piece of, of this business? Uh, I'll tell you what, when I stepped out of my sales team, I thought for certain that things were just going to flop on the floor because those people that I sold houses to were now going to call and not have me. And how could, like, how could they possibly not want me? 
And we, so we developed scripts around that. And you know what? In the first 12 months after I stepped out of my sales team, I got one phone call. Now that doesn't mean the team didn't get tons of phone calls from my past clients. I personally got one phone call from someone who said, I just called and they told me that you weren't uh, able to, to list the property and that I had to go with some other, some other person in your, in your team. And so I then got to use the script personally when the script was this. And trust me, for those of you with even an ounce of ego, this takes a little practice to get out. The script was this. You know what? Thank you so much for calling. It is so good to hear from you. Yes, they gave you the correct information. I've actually stepped away from that portion of my business and hired someone better at that job than I ever was. So when I tell you that you are in absolutely awesome hands and that I'll always be monitoring things from, from, uh, from, uh, from the wings, trust me when I tell you, you are in excellent hands. And that was all they needed to hear, right? So remember, it's, it's, not about the, it's not about what you can build around you. It's about you building something around the standards that you stand for and bring to the table. And as long as those standards are met, people are not necessarily interested in it being you personally. I know we like to think that that's important, and, it, it, and yet it's not. I, I've, I've been there and, and rolled right through that happily right? And continue to roll through that as things continue to grow. Like what, what else am I not going to do that someone else will just do better than me? Donna. Yeah, I was just, so you added the little bit I was going to add, which is when you finally get it through your head and I'm, you know, we're all still working with this, that people actually are in love with your standards. Not exactly you, as long as they can still get the quality, the experience, the service, the knowledge, through your standards, would you put in your the people who are on your team or working around you, they'll be happy with that. In yeah. fact, be overjoyed because I'm off doing what the part of the business or something else that I really want to be doing that could be even served better. Yeah. No, indeed. And and that can come back to them as well, right? I mean, if if I'm if I'm a building a bigger business, right, what that means is I'm finding more buyer opportunities for their listing, or I'm finding more seller opportunities for our buyers, right? I'm off, I'm off growing that piece of it. Maybe I love the marketing piece or the exposure piece, right? Or the events piece. And I'm off doing things that will come back and, and, uh, and, and benefit them like a VIP club or, a, you know, or, or awesome events to, throughout the course of the year, that kind of, of thing. So don't get, don't get mired down in in all that stuff that goes on in our head that it has to always be us. Um, alrighty, so those are four great ahas. They let us down um, some great conversations and I'm gonna cut it off there so that we uh, dive right into our materials today. Um, and those materials, uh, I think Joe sent out the, the uh, buyer consultation scripts again, just in case you um, had misplaced them from last week. He sent them earlier this afternoon. So those should be in your email. And attached to that was an exclusive right to represent buyer document. And so what I'd like to do this afternoon is this. Uh, we have an hour and 45 minutes, which should be just enough time to get us through the buyer consultation scripts, uh, including a, a quick review of the buyer document uh, and how the script kind of overlays that document. And then that will put us, uh, position us really beautifully for tomorrow, which uh, will be the anatomy of a buyer transaction and the cat house story at the end. So uh, that's the schedule for the next hour and 45 minutes today and two hours tomorrow. And then we finish up uh, tomorrow. So nothing on uh, Thursday. All right. So pivoting over to the buyer side, what you'll find is that we, as we go through the buyer consultation scripts that you will you will uh, see that a lot of it is very similar to the list side script. So we'll be able to move a little bit faster uh, through the buy side because you've already been through the list side. Uh, would anyone be terribly offended if I took this jacket off? Because I am. Well, I won't. I, I won't tell you what my grandmother would say in a situation like that. Well, I might if I stop the recording. Hold on a second. No, yeah, I think I won't. Because some, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes my grandmother's phrases 
don't go over all that well. Um, but I was hot, I was sweating. So whew, now I feel free and light as a bird. Um, I have to see my grandmother on Sunday. It was so spectacular. All of us vaccinated. She's 92 and awesome. All right, so uh, buyer consultation script. This will start with your buyers arriving at the uh, at the office to meet you for the consult. Now let me just let me just start with a quick reminder of a couple of things. And I'm going to I'm going to sound a little preachy on this uh, because I I I'm just not sure I understand the level uh, at which we have uh, we have agents who practice the buy side of the industry without a proper buyer consultation. And for the life of me, I I just don't get it. I I just don't understand it. Uh, literally on Friday, I had a conversation with someone who said, you know, the, the, um, I'm unhappy. I want out of the contract. And, you know, my answer to that is typically no. And we'll, you know, we'll find if, if you're really having an issue with that particular agent, we'll find you a replacement, uh, agent to move, to move forward with. But one of the things that, that she quickly pivoted to was, you know, I didn't even know what I was signing. I thought, well, you know, not for nothing. I, I don't advise you signing documents that you haven't read. Tell me, tell me, tell me why you hadn't gone through them. It's like, well, it was just it was DocuSign to me because we were making an offer, and it was just all part of the documents I had to sign when I was making the the offer. No one was there to explain it to me. No one told me about anything. You know, now now did she still sign it? Is that on her? Yes, of course. And yet, I will tell you that if we ever had to utilize that document in a courtroom to attempt to get paid, one of the first things the judge would ask is what kind of consultation, how, how was this explained? What's your, what's your system, Mr. or Mrs. real estate agent, and can you prove it? And if the answer is, well, my system is I kind of willy nilly do things and you know I, I throw papers at people to sign because they have to sign them and, and, and but there's no real consultation where I go over my services or go over the contract or go over anything, guess what? There, there is no judge that likes to hear that because they're, they're, the, the point I'm making is there is precedent in the law that says we have a requirement not just to throw a document at somebody. We have a requirement to help them as a fiduciary, help them understand what it is they're signing and why they're signing it. So my point, when you decide to skip the consultation, a couple of things happen. A, you either struggle with getting buyer representation forms signed or signed as a blanket agreement because you haven't, you haven't had an, op the, the buyer hasn't had an opportunity to understand your services. They don't understand what they're, act why you're, why you're awesome. So then you throw this form up and they're like, oh, really? I have to like get married? We haven't even dated, right? except for the fact that the, the consultation is like a first and second date all rolled into one. The second thing that happens is that you don't know enough about your, your buyers. Who is that a problem for? Everybody is exactly the right answer. It's a problem for the buyers because they haven't gone through the exercise of you helping them self-discover what it is they're really searching for and why which is, by the way, is the important part of that. People oftentimes think they know what they want, but until you help them un uh, uncover why they want what they state they want, it's not connected to anything real. And what I've uncovered is that the more you help them uncover the why behind their what, their what changes. Because once it's married to a why, they think, oh, well, hmm. I hadn't thought about it that way, which means this and this are not really as important to me as these things. And you wonder why you sometimes struggle having them say yes to a property when they're out shopping. So not only does no consultation oftentimes yield problems down the road from a, from a, um, from a legal perspective, no consultation 
almost always yields showing them more properties than you need to. Right? And if that means you, you show them five instead of two or 50 instead of 20, right? I mean, I mean it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Remember that at some point, buyers who are seeing house after 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 house get irritated. And at some point, they're just irritated with you because they don't know who else to be irritated with. And if you haven't done a, a proper consult or you've skipped it all together, understand that you're creating your own issues with buyers down the road, right? When those things happen and those, 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 those resentments start to pop up, or the tough conversations start to come up like, you know what, I don't think you're really representing our interests well. I don't think you have the skills to actually help us win because we've lost so many houses or we're just not finding things or there's, you know, there's nothing for us to look at. All those things. Unfortunately, if you haven't done the consult or a proper consult, you get to look in the mirror and say, aha, it's you. You created this issue, right? And then you have to help help yourself dig out of it. And we'll talk about that. We, oui, madame. And and right now in this market, I mean, if you don't do a proper buyer consult in this market, I mean, you you should really have your head examined. I mean, they need buyers need to understand what they're about to step into because it's unlike anything we've ever seen before, much less them. I mean, I, this, this is going to cut to the chase, even if they don't fully get it when we're sitting there at the table talking about it, when we get into the trenches and I turn and I say, remember we talked about this? They'll at least have a like, oh yeah. And when they lose the second and third, they're like, oh, that's what, but we have to find out if they're even up to this. This is not a market for everybody. It's just not. Yeah. Yeah. And think about the idea of, of saving everyone time, effort and energy by having those conversations, right? Minimally, once you start writing an offer, if they've already heard the conversation about 99 to 102% of, of ask of list price on average, you know, they, they've heard the conversations around waiving a number of contingencies, paying cash if they can, making something non-refundable, right? Shortening all the, all, the, all the inspection and the contract and whatever, you know, all that stuff. If, if you're only hearing it for the first time while they're writing the offer, it's no wonder they, they don't write strong offers because it starts to, and guys, I'm sorry if this is offensive, but it, it, is, it is the way our buyers think. It starts to sound like you're attempting to sell a house, not help them buy a house. You see the difference, right? And when you set proper expectations, and then follow up and then and then that arrives instead of it sounding like you were you were telling them a fib you you look like wonder woman or superman because all the things you told them show up right it's like oh my goodness good thing we had this conversation because now i feel a little bit more prepared for this the, the intensity that this market is is uh, is is bringing our way i understand what i have to do to to leap to the front. Whether they're willing to do that or not is a secondary conversation, but at least, they're, at least they know that you knew what you were talking about, you're on their side, and you're not just there to sell a house, right? When all that other stuff comes up as they're writing the offer and they still think they can write an offer for you know, 10% lower than the ask price, and, and that's when you choose to tell them about what's going on in the market, you, you've, you've lost their trust. Regardless of regardless of how much they, how how trustworthy you are, you've lost it because they think in their minds, ah, real estate agent, here I am putting pen to paper. They just want to sell a house. You've you've got to be their fiduciary from minute one. You can't just show up that way later on, right? And when you set proper expectations, again, it changes everything. Lisa Bennett. 
I have a question. So in your, your, your buyer consultation, and you're trying to prepare them for this kind of market, and you explain to them what highest and best actually means, you know, not just best price, but I mean, not just highest price, but best clean terms. And you explain it to them every which way, but when, you know, every way possible. And they nod and they say yes. But then when it comes time to put in eight, nine offers, like I've been through with this client, they just layer it up with the contingencies, including radon when there's already a mitigation system in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, as, as Donna said before, this is not a market where everyone will purchase, right? And so, so the, the, if it were me, we would, I would have a, a secondary consult or, or a third consult or a fourth consult, right? Or, I mean, th there may have to be additional consults and the language may have to get a little bit, I don't, I don't, uh, the, the language may have to get a little bit clearer, right? I'll use the word clearer. Uh, what I really mean is a little uh, firmer, not in a rude or condescending way ever, right? Because it's always about education, but I, I have, I had a coach. Uh, she was my longest term coach. Uh, she was, she was my coach for, I don't know, a decade or so. And uh, I think I told you this, but I'll, I'll reiterate it because it's relevant here. One of the things that I learned from her, because she, she would ask me this every single time we would, we would talk is when something positive occurred, she would stop me and say, okay, A, did you celebrate that? B, what brought that into your world? And I would always have to stop, right? I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I don't need a pat on the back. Let's get on to the next thing kind of guy, right? And so, so no, I hadn't celebrated it. And I didn't, I didn't stop to think what brought that my way. And so, so the, the pause that she would, she would encourage me to take to say, okay, well, what did bring that? Why did that end positively? And she had the same advice when something went wrong, when something w didn't end positively. Like, let's, let's just go back. If you, could, if you could have done one thing differently in that experience to change the result, what do you think it would have been? And I believe that those kinds of conversations, those kinds of consultative educational conversations with our buyer clients, especially in a scenario like this right now, are massively important. Right. I love what Donna put in the chat. Start it with, may I have your permission to speak frankly? May I have your permission to, to, you know, on a scale of one to 10 with one being wrapped in pillows and 10 being kind of right between the eyeballs, what kind of conversation would you like to have about um, your ability to secure a property? And then just start asking some questions. In this last scenario, what one thing do you believe you could have done differently to create a different result, to have had the sellers say yes to that scenario? And then, and then sit on your lips. I mean, you have to really take the stapler out and ka-chick because they have to come up with it. You can't, you can't keep telling them because you telling them at some point, they've, just, they've lost their hearing for you at some point when you tell them the same thing over and over again. So you've got, to, you've got to educate differently. You've got to ask them questions because if this, is, if this does not turn into self-discovery, no result will ever change. So at some point through those questions and through that self-discovery, and maybe you have buyers who, who say, well, you know, I'm not playing that game. You know, I, again, I understood. I, I apologize that fr frankly, that these kinds of questions and this kind of consultation um, it, on my side, not a game at all. I, I'm, I'm doing everything I can think of to assist you in creating the result you're looking for. So if you wouldn't mind, just take a moment. There's no right or wrong answer. That part of the script's important, right? There's no right or wrong answer. What is it that you believe you could have done differently in the last scenario to create a different result and have them kind of break it down? Have them look at it and say, you know what, maybe we could have offered 10,000 more. Maybe, we, maybe, when, maybe when they said highest and best, we could have removed a different term. Maybe we could have agreed to that closing date that they, that they said was important to them, even though we went with the one that's important to us. 
have them identify the things in each of those offers. And it, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's too late to do that now. I wouldn't do it with all eight. I wouldn't lay out all eight and, because that just beats them over the head with, with some failure. But certainly go back to the last one or two and do an M&M. You know M&M, right? It's a medical term for morbidity and mortality, right? When, when, when a doctor loses a patient, when the patient dies, there's a board that meets, it's the M&M &M board, right? And there's, there's, a, there's a discussion around what could have been done differently in that scenario to create a different result. So have a bit of an M&M &M with, the, with the client. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. So, you know, and it's, it's so critically important as we walk through and are the people who are not selected um, when we put in our offer to find out more information from the listing agent, why, how can I make, how could I have made my client's offer stronger is what I ask. And often they'll tell me because, you know, we've, we've moved on now. I'm not, I'm not asking, not begging for them to take my, I would try it, but that isn't what I'm doing. Um, and they'll tell you, and I turn around and I tell the client that each step of the way. So by the time we get to the third, sometimes if I'm lucky, definitely by the seventh, one, <laughs> We walk into the house and they're like, I love this one. This is the one. And they're not fighting me. Okay, we're going higher than they're telling I, they or if they're like slow to learn, they'll say, well, what should we do? And I always say, you tell me what we should do because we've been through this seven times. What do you think? And they come up with exactly the right answer. The ones that are motivated, the ones that wanna be there, they get it, they're tired of losing. Yeah. Remember, you can educate people to a win. You cannot create motivation where motivation does not exist. So if you have unmotivated people, they're just unmotivated people, right? You have to get better and better at recognizing the motivation. That, that, what, what that becomes is a lead generation and conversion issue more than a buyer skills issue. What I mean by that is when you recognize that you have unmade, unmotivated uh, buyers, it may be time to move on from them. It may be time, and I'm not saying dump them, but you may have to reschedule how you spend your time. If they're the only buyers on the table, guess what? You're going to spend whatever time they believe they need and you won't start to behave in a, in a, in a manner that assists them in making clearer decisions. The simple reality is just like I said to you on the list side, on the buyer side, the buyers know the right answers. They're not stupid. They know the right answers. You have to ask them the right questions to be able to allow them to come up with, to, to bring those answers to the forefront. Some of them don't like the answers and they hide behind their dislike of the answers. They hide behind distrust of the industry. They hide behind you're working for the seller, not for me, right? All those things that, that sometimes get said, right, out loud. There's a reason why we've heard them all before because they're, they're just these cliches that get, that get used. And what it is, it's, 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 it's smokescreen. It's, it's, it's just the deflection technique that clients are predisposed to deliver. Like the example Via gave earlier today, right? When you walk into the gap and someone says to you, can I help you? You have your own deflection techniques. No, thank you, I'm just, I'm just looking. You know, Thanks, I'll find you if I need you. Not just yet, I'm, I'm, I need to go return something. Whatever your thing is, right? But you each have one. So don't think that your buyers and sellers are terrible human beings because they have their own deflection techniques for you because we all do it. All righty. Yes, Lisa, any, uh, one, another, another question on that? Yes, one quick one. Um, yes. should, sometimes we just cut them loose. If you've worked with them nine months, they've lost eight listings, you've shown them 85 properties, and you have been as direct to say, layering all the contingencies, what is that gaining you? You know, you're losing homes. And they still say, I know it lowers the chances, and then they're all disappointed they lost it. Should you just tell them that 
from what you've seen, you don't believe they're ready to buy a house in this market and maybe we should put it on hold until the market starts to shift? Yeah, that that, that could be. And, and again, I, I won't speak generically uh, around that because it, I think that's a that's a, a, a client by client um, opportunity or, or decision to make. Uh, and yet at some point, uh, if, if, if you can honestly step back from it and say, you know what, I, I, have, I have exhausted the, um, every learning opportunity, every, every powerful question, uh, every consultative approach that I can think of here, and, and, uh, and perhaps some that I haven't thought of, uh, I might do one of two things. I might remove myself from the scenario, and that looks something like this. You know, guys, I, I, uh, I have been giving this a whole lot of thought. And what I'm wondering is if, if, if I'm personally not hearing you the way I need to be hearing you in order to help you create success. And so what I've done is I've, I've brought my colleague Donna Gilbert along today to just kind of run through a, a quick, uh, quick follow-up consult to make sure that we're we're just we're all on the same page. Again, I want your success more than anything else. And I'm more than happy to set aside any ego that comes along with, with my skills and abilities to make sure that we're all talking the same language. And I might have Donna do a little consult. Maybe I step back completely and I send them out with Donna, right? Instead of kicking them to the curb, I, I, would, I would rather bring help in to see if that helped, because guys, I have experienced it myself. There are times where you call on me for help. I say the same things in a similar way that you've said to clients over and over and over again. I, I just say it from like a third party exterior position and they're nodding their head. Oh yes, oh, that's exactly right. Oh, he's, oh, that's love. Oh, he's very smart and very good looking. My goodness. No, no, I, sorry, I got, I got, well, that's a different conversation, but the, 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 idea of, the idea of me saying the same things as you say and them thinking that, that I'm brilliant and you're not, that's only because you've been saying it over and over again and you have a personal relationship. I come in from the outside and sound like a genius, right? And so I've watched that, that, uh, that idea, that strategy work. And the thing that oftentimes gets in our way around bringing somebody else in is ego. And so I would say, Put that, put that in your pocket, right? And that's harder for some of us than it is for others, right? Some of us have a, 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 a stronger um, sense of, of ego than others of us. But I will tell you that if you can go ahead and put that in your pocket and bring in a colleague, you'll then know, right? If I couldn't do it and Donna couldn't do it, you know what, these people aren't buying a house, right? But it might give you some more information. So I would, I would go that path first before saying, maybe this is not the best time for you. Maybe we should put it on pause. Maybe that makes the better sense. I would bring in a colleague to see what, what they could maybe do. All righty. So let's dive into our scripts now that we've had uh, the, the conversation about the consult. So is there anyone who uh, is unclear about how important having an actual buyer consult is? Right. If you don't do one yourselves, I would I would make today. Mark your calendar. It's May the eighteenth, two thousand twenty-one. Today is the last day that you are one of those real estate agents because beginning tomorrow at eight a.m., you are now an agent who always does a buyer consult. For those of you who have uh, who have teams, who have agents who work the buy side for you or expect to in the, in the near or distant future. Remember, it is your job to ensure that those agents are doing a proper consult. The conversation I said I had on Friday was with an agent on a team. And when I spoke to the, the leader of that team and asked, well, what's, what's, what is the typical buyer consult look like? What's the system? What's the program? Have you rehearsed it? Have you seen it? Have you inspected what you expect? Let me restate that. Have you inspected what you expect? That's the way you say that. And the answer was no, 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 and I'm not sure. 
right? So remember that that part of part of your job as the as the owner of that organization, as the leader of that team, you need to be modeling for the people in your world. You need to make sure that they understand what a proper consult looks like. And if you haven't had them do one with you as the buyer, I would schedule that immediately. Put that on there. Put that on the calendar. And then have them do it once a week with you, minimally, for the next 13 weeks. And then launch them into the world. All right, so let's dive into the script. So script number one, step number one is setting the stage. If you remember, we had setting the stage on the list side of the business. This is the setting the stage on the buyer side of the, uh, of the business. Oh, you know what? I am so sorry. Uh, let, me, let me also speak to the other side of what I just said. If you are an agent on a team who's on this call and the, and the leader of your team has not asked you about your buyer consult or has not rehearsed that with you or has not set up some time to kind of role play that with you consistently over a number of, number of weeks, please raise your hand to or with them to say, I would like it if you would put this in place with me because I, I want you to raise your hand and say, I wanna get better. I want to improve. And one of the ways that you can improve is to just continue to practice it, right? And that's what the, that's what the leader of, that, of your team is there for, is to help you get better so that the, the team can, can, uh, can win at a higher level. So let, I wanna just cover both sides of that. All right, so setting the stage. Everyone have that in front of them? All right, so let's run through the setting the stage piece. In the interest of time, uh, I am going to, uh, to play your agent. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. Did you have any trouble finding the office? Great, so now before we get started, can I get you some water or coffee? No, nope? okay, great. Look, I am really excited to start this home search process with you today. And the very first thing I'm going to do is turn off my cell phone so that we do not have any interruptions and go ahead and get that done for you. I want you to know that today's meeting is all about you. My job today is to keep us focused to find out what kind of home will suit your lifestyle, your needs, your wants, and your budget. We'll talk about the home buying process a little bit. We'll answer any and all of your questions and then discuss our expectations and roles in this partnership. How does that sound to you? All right, awesome. So now Mr. and Mrs. Byer, look, there, there are really only three possible outcomes to today's meeting. One, you'll understand all of the benefits that I can provide to you in your home search and you will hire me as your buyer's agent. Number two, after hearing what I can offer, you may decide that what I bring to the table is not a great fit for you and your family and you may choose not to hire me. Or three, it is possible that I may determine that I cannot meet or exceed the expectations that you have set and I will choose to turn you down now rather than let you down later. Does that make sense to you? Excellent. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to switch gears and talk about the home that you desire. I'm going to ask a lot of questions in order to develop a clear understanding of what you're looking for in your next home. This way, I won't waste your time by taking you to see properties that simply don't suit you. How does that sound? All righty. So there's your setting the stage script. I kind of blew through it. What did you notice? What did you hear? If you remember, the list side was broken into kind of three sections, right? It was the intro, the agenda, and then motivation. What do you notice about this setting the stage script? Go ahead, Karen. Well, I think it's uh, definitely an, an introduction, but you also made them feel at ease, feel at ease. And I think they had no choice than saying yes to any of your, all of your questions. Well, what's, so what's interesting is that what I'm hearing Karen say is by setting the expectation of hiring, mm -hmm. you are more likely to get hired. And I guess what? I 100% agree with that. If you set no expectation about what you're there to do, if you don't make it known that this is a conversation that will end in me asking you whether or not you want to hire me, just like the list side, Oftentimes, as agents, we then don't, 
or we get stuck thinking, okay, well, now these folks think I'm, we're running out to see a house and I have to bring this form up. Oh, I hate this form. I, oh, I wish I didn't have to do this form. Oh, it always, it always just kind of throws me off. It felt like we were, we were enjoying each other so much. And now I have to bring up the legal blah, 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 right? And, and so many of you are nodding your heads and laughing because you've, you've, you've experienced that, right? I speak of the truth. And so what's so cool about setting the expectations clearly right up front is that you then don't have to worry about that because you're just telling them what they're here for. First, you're doing the intro, right? And that includes, by the way, making sure they understand that this conversation is about them. I love the, the physicality of stopping and saying, you know what, I'm just going to shut my phone off while we talk. I don't know how many of you are doing that, but it, it's a powerful message. It is a powerful, powerful, the, the words are, are far less powerful than you actually flipping it off. Let me restate that. Than you actually turning your phone off. I, I don't mean you should flip your phone off. Certainly don't flip the buyers off, right? That would be just weird and probably not accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. Right, and the hope would be that they would kind of do the same. I will tell you that my experience is that that hardly ever happens, right? And yet you are certainly free to turn your phone off. Think about how much more focused you can be if your phone isn't sitting there buzzing or even worse, ringing or ding-a-linging or, or singing Country Roads by John Denver or whatever you have it set at, right? Because your, your kid's calling or whatever. You know what, for, for a 20 to 30 minute buyer consult, you can live with your phone turned off. Like none of us is that important. And yet the buyer needs to be certain that, that you believe they are. Make sense? We then go through the agenda piece. We're going to discuss all this stuff, right? It's focused on you about what, what property will suit your, your needs, your lifestyle, all those things, including their budget. And then we set the hiring expectation. The other thing I love about this script in terms of the hiring expectation is that it gives them, it'll, it shows them that there are some options here, right? You'll either hire me or you won't, or I may determine that I can't meet or, for, meet or exceed your needs and then I may turn you down now rather than let you down later, right? So I may, you may say yes, you may say no, or I may say yes or no. And so it's a two-way street. We're going to make, we're going to spend the, the next 20 to 30 minutes kind of getting to understand what it is you need and once I determine that I can meet and exceed those needs, I'll then ask you if you believe that to be true. You'll say yes, and we'll be off. Or you'll say no, and then we'll have some further conversation or we'll, we'll part, part ways as friends, right? Some, let me remove that word, many agents don't go through that process because they feel like, they feel threatened by their own words, right? And what I mean by that is, if you are not confident enough to state one of these three things will happen, including the fact that, that look, if we're not a good match, we're not a good match. Because you're, you, you come at this from the perspective of, I have to sell every new client that sits down in front of me a house. Trust me when I tell you that you're, you're, you're coming at that from, from a scarcity mentality rather than abundance mentality. An abundance mentality allows you to sit down and just be present and consult. And whatever happens at the end of the consult, I'm okay with. Because my, my job at that moment is the consult. And when I'm completely focused on the consult and not the end result, not the outcome, not the, oh my goodness, that form is coming up soon, right? When I'm completely focused on the consult, Buyers feel that and are much more likely to want to hire you, right? So it's funny, it's, it's, it's like when we, when we get control over our own confidence, we create more of the result that we're looking for. When we're not in control of our own confidence, that leads to a result that we may not be looking for more times than it does the result we are looking for. 
And so what I'm, what I'm, what I'm communicating to you is you getting hired is far more about you, your ability to be okay either way than it is you kind of working hard to make sure that you're the best you can possibly be. Because sometimes we overwork it. Consultation is about relaxing and being present and listening with all three ears, right? What do I mean by all three ears? The two ears you were given and your mouth has to turn into an ear during a consultation, right? Because, because when you use it as a mouth, sometimes you start stepping on yourself. Any questions about setting the stage and about its, uh, its function? Any concerns about it? Are you certain that you, after practice, you can say those, those things? Go ahead, Nancy. Rick, I've always found this to be a great script, um, particularly with uh, buyers that I have no history with, right? I'm meeting them for the first time and you're going into an office environment to, to do this script. Where I've struggled has been more with people that I know or coming to me uh, through my sphere of influence. Um, and there's that uh, trust that they're going to work with me or, you know, that I, I, I have a tendency to not be as specific in this script. And, and truth be told, sometimes it's hurt me in the end because I haven't set the stage well. Yeah, I, and I, I love that you brought that up because it, it um, I, I get it. Because sometimes it, sometimes it feels a little, almost like goofy. Yeah. Because, because you, you have these past clients, you know, you're, you're, sometimes you're friendly with them. Sometimes there's a, a personal relationship on the, on the exterior, right? One of the things that I used to do uh, whenever I worked with someone who I'd either worked with before or had more of a personal relationship with, I would set the stage slightly differently. And I would add, I would add in, you know what, Nancy, it is, it is so great to see you again. Or, or maybe like, I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that we're, we're pursuing this together. You know, wasn't dinner on Saturday fun, right? Depending on, on who these folks are, right? And I'll give you both versions. So when it's the repeat client, it's so, it's so great to, to, uh, to be back in touch. It's so great to, uh, to be working together. Again, I so look forward to our time together. I just wanted to kind of upfront say to you, look, I don't want you to get anything less than any other client. And just because we have a pre-existing relationship, I'm not going to skip any steps, right? And you may even want me to skip some steps, right? And may, and may kind of hear some of the questions as well, but you know the answer to that, right? Because we've worked together before. I want to be certain that you get me at my best and that my fullest attention, which means if it's all right with you, we're just going to go through the process like I would go through it with anybody I'm meeting for the first time. Because at the end of the day, that is really the best benefit to you, which turns into a benefit back to me as we're really clear with each other. Would that be all right? And just kind of ask their permission. And, and that wasn't brilliant, but you, you, you get the point, right? You get the, the, um, the underlying tone of, I'm thrilled that you're here. Let's just call out the personal relationship for what it is. And if it's all right with you, I want to come at it from what if, what if we didn't have that personal relationship or a strong personal relationship to make sure that we're not missing anything. Does that, does that help in, in any way? It does. It does. Um, just I have to remember to, to make sure that I don't skip that step. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's the, and you could all, you could also, you know, depending on what the results have been, you could then, you could tell a story. I, I, I like to kind of tell stories to make points as well. And so if there was a scenario where, you know, when you skipped that initial step up front, there was some kind of issue down, down the line, you could tell a shortened version of that. You know, I, I made that mistake one time with a, with a personal friend. And frankly, it, we, it, we got to a point a couple of weeks later where had I not skipped that step, we, we would have had a smoother transaction. And so again, I, I just looking to learn from, uh, from, from previous experiences. I would love it if you and I just kind of started from 
the beginning as if we didn't have that personal relationship. Right? Rick, so do you think do you think you can do this over the phone with a personal, you know, somebody from your SOI or or you have a past relationship, or do you think that you still need to have that in face meeting? Yeah. So uh, I have two answers to that. My my first answer is uh, I still believe, uh, regardless, that each of you is more powerful in person than you are uh, on the telephone, and we have a third option nowadays. So the second way I'll answer that is we have a third option called Zoom. And so oh, if if you're not going to be meeting in the office in person, uh, I would rather you resort to, to a, a face-to-face on Zoom because then you're not giving up body language. You're not giving up facial expressions. And so much of communication is nonverbal, especially when you start to ask questions about, about houses and, and details and amenities and all that stuff. Um, for me, the phone is harder because I, I just can't see you. And I, I, I like to find all the clues in your face and in your, in your body, you know, when you cross your arms this way or, you know, or do one of these or look at each other, you know, a couple, they have different glances when, when, they're, when they're in agreement versus when they're not in agreement. So you miss all that if you're not uh, seeing them. So my answer would be, I like, my go-to would still be face-to-face and if not face-to-face, do it on Zoom so that you don't lose the nonverbal stuff on the telephone. Yes? Cool. All right, let's move to step number two. Step number two is the needs analysis. Now, the needs analysis in the buyer consult, I will tell you, is A, the most important part of the buyer consult, and B, the longest part of the buyer consult, and it's also the part where you speak the least. So it's the most important, it's the longest, and it's the part where you speak the least. Because your role here is to just ask questions and continue to prompt a bit of a brain dump from the buyer. You want them, you want all of their contribution. You want to just, whatever is in their head, you want it out of their head and out on a piece of paper. And then you'll come back and organize it a little bit later. Right. And so the needs analysis goes something like this. We're going to start by explaining to them the process of the top five must haves and then ask them um, a winning question, a question that they don't have to struggle with. And it goes something like this. By the way, the very last page of your package is a version of the top five must have list that looks something like this. So if you want to haul that out so you can be looking at it while we're, while we're going through the needs analysis, I encourage you to do that. And again, it's the very last page of the consult scripts. So our goal, Mr. and Mrs. Byer, today is to help you create your top five must-have list for your next home, right? And at that point, they would have that one, one in front of them, one in front of you. In order to help you do that, I'd like, to, I'd like uh, for you to start by have, uh, oh my goodness, it would be helpful if reading was part of my uh, skill set. I would like to start by having you describe for me the home that you are currently living in. And so the reason, can you, can you think of why we start there? Why do we start with the home for the, them describing the home that they're currently living in? Because either they don't like it anymore or they will miss it. Yeah, right, exactly, right? So they, they know what they like and what they don't like far more simply if you ground them in the house that they're in the in the whatever that is if it's their house if it's an apartment if they're living with their their in-laws wherever they're coming from i want you to describe that home ultimately they're modeling for themselves the conversation you're going to prompt them to have with you about the house that they're looking for and sometimes when we ask buyers to describe what they're looking for they get stuck because they're not a hundred percent sure I would offer to you that 99% of the time, buyers are not 100% sure of what they're looking for, right? It's why no consultation creates havoc later on, because you, you haven't helped them understand what it, what it really is they're searching for. And so what I like to do is, is to give them an easy task. Don't tell me about what you want. Describe for me the home that you're currently living in. What do you love about it? What do you wish you could change about it? And as they start doing that, you're there taking some notes. 
I would put a little star next to the things they love, right? Maybe they mentioned the fireplace nine different times when they're describing the house, right? If all of a sudden a fireplace doesn't come up as one of their top five must-haves, I might mention, you know, based on the home that you are currently living in, you mentioned the fireplace a whole bunch of times. I'm curious, is that something that should show up on your top five must-have list? You didn't mention it. And then they get to say, oh my goodness, you know what? How could we have forgotten that? Like the fireplace is the most important part of, a, of, our, of the house for us, right? And I got that because I was listening when you described the house that you're currently living in and you mentioned it over and over and over again. I love when the cat curls up by the fireplace, you know, in the winter. I love sitting next to it when it's snowing and reading the newspaper. I, you know, I love, I love hiding the kid's Easter basket in there. They never think to look there, you know, a lot, whatever, 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 but it's come up a lot. So you see how you can utilize that. So you, you allow them to give you as much detail as they uh, desire about the house they're currently living in. Now, one of the scripts that I want you to write down that's not on your form is this. It's a short, really powerful script. What else? That's it, that's the script. What else? Maybe it's a smile and what else, maybe it's got it and what else, maybe it's I understand and what else, maybe it's that's, you know, fascinating, what else? However you're going to validate, but you'll what else them until they're kind of done with their, with their current house. And then you'll move to thanking them, you know, thank you so much for that. Can you now describe the home that you're looking for? Can we take a, a pivot to the left here and describe the home that you're looking to purchase? Now you'll note in the middle of this page, it says, remember the needs analysis does not typically follow a specific script, right? Because you're just simply asking them questions. Buyers will start at different places. Some buyers are very kind of objective around, okay, what am I looking for? Even if they've just given you all this detail about where they're living currently, you flip them to what is it you're looking for? Well, we wanna live in Wilton, four bedrooms, three and a half baths on two acres with a two car garage and a finished basement. Is that enough? Can you go and find them the perfect property? Let me restate that. Can you go and find them a property that they will make an offer on? See, I don't think you can. I don't, I think that it's too limited. There are a lot of properties that fit the criteria I just described. They won't buy 80% of them. Maybe 90% of them. Because we don't know the why behind any of the detail, right? So now it's up to you, right? The script for you in, in this needs analysis, if you have someone who kind of just gives you name, rank, and serial number about the house they're looking for, you then get to ask some questions. You're writing it down, that's awesome. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Can you, can you describe what's, what's, what's behind the four bedrooms? Now maybe the answer is, um, well, we, we have three children and they each need a place to sleep, right? Maybe the why is, is very simple. However, maybe the why isn't simple at all. Maybe the why is, you know, we need that fourth bedroom or we need the fifth bedroom, whatever that number might be, because uh, my in-laws come and stay with us half the year. Maybe the answer is we need that extra bedroom because um, we have a, uh, you know, our, our, our kids are musicians and we have a drum set and a, grand, and a baby grand piano that we need an extra room for. And because it's drums, we need it to like close tightly and. And, and, and if, if soundproofing is an option, we can do that, right? Maybe, maybe somebody needs a craft room. Maybe somebody works at home and needs an office. Until you understand what those bedrooms are going to be used for, it's difficult for you to then offer alternatives. In the scenario I just painted, maybe a three bedroom house with a den and a finished lower level would be just as functional for these folks and maybe they could spend a little less money. Maybe it opens up other opportunities for them. 
instead of only having four bedrooms or only having five bedrooms. I can't even remember what I said up front. So whatever, whichever one I said. But do you see how asking the questions behind the facts helps you get better detail? Let's go through at the bottom of this page some of those, what those questions look like. First one, can you describe what that looks like to you? Right? Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they've said, oh, you know, we, we just we want something that you know, looks like New England. I understand. Can, can, you, can, you, can you describe that for me a little bit more? What does that look like for you? Do me a favor, close your eyes a little bit. Close your eyes and, and talk to me about what New England looks like. Do you ever have somebody say that? I want a house that looks like New England. I've had that said to me a whole bunch of times. I'm like, what does that mean? I, like, are, are you looking for like Cape Cod, New England? Is that what you mean by, and, and does, that then, does that then skew the style house you're looking for? Does it have to have different color hydrangea in the front? Like, I mean, what, what does that really look like? And without asking them to describe it and get really detailed on it, you could be pedaling down the wrong path. Right, sometimes they say things like, we need a big kitchen. We need a big yard. Write this down. If I gave this to you before, um, uh, then write it down again, because it's important. The two cues, right? Did I tell you about the two cues? Right, so the two cues are quantify and qualify. And so as a consultant, you're always relying on those two cues. You ask a question, someone gives an answer. If it's not descriptive enough, or it hasn't gone three layers deep, you may have to either what else that question or stay specific to that question. Ah, big kitchen, can you describe that for me? How, how big is big? Tell me why a big kitchen is important to you. Maybe they're moving out of a studio in Manhattan. So like big kitchen is, we can fit both the stove and the refrigerator in the same space. Right, that could be big kitchen. Or maybe they, they have an enormous family and do tons of entertaining and want to be certain that not only is there an, a massive island for cooking and hanging out, but there's also a, 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 a table, a, an area for a table big enough for at least six to eight. Plus all the appliances, plus tons of counter space, right? So big, it, it, that's a word that doesn't help us until we understand what big means to them. Right? We want a big yard. Great. Can you quantify that for me? Big yard from someone who is moving from downtown LA is a whole lot different than someone who's moving from, you know, Montana or Iowa. And then asking that second or third level question, talk to me about why. So maybe they maybe they quantify it. Well, two acres. Can you quantify? why those two acres are important. Maybe the answer is we, we kind of just want privacy. Awesome, and so, so if, if the two acres is there for privacy, I'm curious if we could find you a property that wasn't quite two acres, that was really more in a one acre zone with great screening on either side of the property and a land preserve in the back, right? Because now you're thinking about some um, neighborhoods in, in Wilton or in Weston, I find. I'm having trouble remembering my examples, so I'm sorry if I, if I said Wilton or Weston, one of those two. There are land trusts in each of them, right? So maybe it backs up to Devil's Den, maybe it backs up to, you know, and so now all of a sudden they don't need that second acre because privacy comes naturally. And here's the benefit of that. You don't have to pay taxes on the land. You don't have to maintain it, right? So are, are you able to understand what it is they're really looking for and why based on these kinds of questions? And so that third question, why is that important to you, is really a crazy important question. And I find it's the one that most agents leave out of the conversation because it, feel, it feels a little funky or weird, right? Why it feels a little feely, like a little touchy feely. So some of you are thinking, yeah, that's, I love that question for that reason, right? And the other half of you are like, oh, 
Yeah, it's like, that's a question, really. You know, who, am I the social worker here? Why, why, why am I asking this question? And the, the reason you're asking the question is because it takes both logic and emotion for people to make decisions. And so if you're only focused on the one, don't be surprised when, you, when you're not able to assist people in making decisions because you need to help them bring both to the table. Don't be afraid to ask question number four there. What exactly do you mean by a large kitchen? What exactly do you mean by private? What exactly do you mean by easily commutable? Right, what I find is that oftentimes we're in that, we get into that yes mode of anything the client says, I'm going to just, oh, okay, thank you so much for sharing that. And we don't challenge some of the things they say. And without challenging some of the things they say, you may be, you may be finding them property that's easily commutable to the wrong place because you never bothered to ask, right? You wanna live in Wilton or Weston, okay, that's great, easily commutable, and we think they mean easily commutable to New York. But we never bothered to ask exactly what, you, what they mean by that. When you talk about commute, exactly where is it you are commuting? Do you drive or do you take the train? Like what, those are the follow-up questions to a commuting conversation. Because if you don't ask, they could commute to Hartford. And then you're on the wrong side of each of those towns, right? So you have to continue to ask questions to make sure you're getting the right data. I'm gonna to come to that question in a second, uh, Lisa. Uh, let, let me get there. I also love this next question. What does having X accomplish for you? It's another version of why is that important to you, right? But you can mix and match those, those questions. I love these next couple of questions. You know what, keep asking that if you would, or tell me some more about that. Talk to me about that. They're just open invitations to, for the buyer to just kind of keep rattling on about those things that are important to them. You probably notice I do it to you guys all the time. When someone asks a question, if I'm not 100% sure I'm answering the right question, I'll throw it back to you. Tell me some more about that. Keep asking that question. Could you restate that? Could you rephrase that question? I don't want to answer a question that isn't being asked, or I don't want to answer a question thinking something else has been asked only to find out later on, I didn't ask enough questions and I never, I never actually gave the right answer. Did I tell you the story about little Jimmy and little Tommy? Some of, some of you know it. I don't think I've, I've said it uh, so far in class. And so, um, so little Jimmy comes home, he's like nine years old, gets off the bus, comes home from school, runs in uh, the back door. His mother's there, you know, prepping kitchen, uh, prepping the kitchen for, uh, for dinner. And little Jimmy comes flying in the back door, throws his backpack on the ground and says, mommy, 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 <clears throat> where do I come from? And she's like, you know, cutting up the cucumbers and puts down the knife. She's like, oh my goodness, like, really? I was not prepared for this conversation this afternoon. Like, I'm in, I'm in the middle of this salad. I still have to make a meatloaf. And frankly, I really was hoping that his father was gonna have this conversation with him. And he is not home for another three hours. Crap a doodles, now what do I do? So she sits him down and starts the conversation and gets to the meat and potatoes and finishes the conversation about where little Jimmy comes from. And she finishes up and says, you know, do, do you have any questions? And little Jimmy is sitting there with his, literally his chin is on the table, not knowing, not expecting. And he, not, he shakes his head, you know, no, I have no questions. And she says, well, you know, I'm, I'm curious, little Jimmy, why is it that you came home and asked me that question today? And little Jimmy looks at her and says, well, I was on the bus and Tommy was telling us that he was from Philadelphia. So I just wondered where I came from. But I'm bummed, right? So, but you get the point of the story, right? He came home and asked a question. 
She didn't ask any other questions. She heard one thing. He meant something very different. She had this entire conversation that wasn't necessary and wasn't answering his question anyway. I wonder how many times we put ourselves in those same kinds of positions, professionally or personally, because we don't take a moment and ask another question to get clarity, right? Had she just taken a moment and said, oh crap, really? So Jimmy, tell me what, keep asking me that question. What, what, is, what exactly is it that you're looking to know today? He would have then said, well, I just got off the bus and Tommy said he was from Philadelphia. And so I wonder where I came from. She could have said, oh, you, 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 were, you were born at Norwalk Hospital right up the street. Now go do your homework, I'm making dinner. <laughs> right? And she could have saved herself a whole lot of trouble. So you get the point. I'm looking to demonstrate to you why asking questions and continually asking questions and asking questions to the point where you kind of feel like you, you're asking too many questions is far more beneficial to you and the person you're consulting than not. Don't make any assumptions. All right, so what happens Rick, when you find that specific feature? Yes, Nancy. Hey Rick, very quickly if I can, I just have to share a, a, a true story um, that happened to me and I learned the lesson and I wanna share it with everybody, I'll go quick. Years ago, many years ago, I was working with um, a couple coming out of New York and we had a buyer consult and they were giving me their criteria and I asked the question, um, and do you wanna be on a busy road or a quiet road? And of course they said they wanted to be on a quieter road. So lo and behold, we went on our tour and I had my tour all scheduled. And this goes back in the day when they were in my car. And as we were driving, um, they were bringing up some houses that we were passing. And they were like, oh, that looks nice. Are we gonna see that today? And I'd be like, no, we're not seeing that one today. Well, is it not in our price range? No, it's, it's in your price range. So I could see that they were starting to get a little bit agitated that while I'm passing these houses, right? That they, at least from the outside, like. So I finally asked the question. I said, you know, you guys told me you didn't want to be on a busy road. And, you know, we're passing these houses that you're bringing up. And they go, this isn't a busy road because it's relative. For them, the FDR drive or the Van Wick <laughs> is, is a busy road, right? But for me, you know, Newtown Avenue in Norwalk is what I would call a busy road. And they saw that as perfectly residential. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, so I learned that lesson that you just have to kind of keep going with the questions so that you you understand what their frame of mind is for it. Yeah. Yeah, so clearly important. And 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 thank you for sharing that because because it 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 brings up another uh, another strategy. Sometimes you don't necessarily get to every single thing in your needs analysis prior to you then starting to search for homes. And so when you've taken really good notes in the needs analysis, right? Then what Nancy could do is as she's driving up Newtown, what did you say? Newtown Avenue or wherever, right? Driving up that street, she could turn to them and say, or if they're in the car behind them, call them and say, hey, you know what? In our consult, you mentioned about busy road versus not busy road. I'm curious, we're driving on a road now. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Right? Do you consider that to be more of a busy road or more of a, of a, of a residential road? Right? So then you can, once you have what you've asked the questions and you understand kind of where their head is at, even if the question isn't 100% answered in the consult, you can then pepper your conversation with them as you're going through houses or as you're driving to houses with those questions and get better info. Right? It, I, I'll tell you what, guys, I, I've not come to a point in uh, on the buy side of the business, frankly, I, on either side of the business, where I have found that asking another question is not the better or more appropriate path forward or the, or the, more, the, the, the more efficient and effective path forward. Always ask another question. Sometimes I hear from people that Asking so many questions makes me feel like I don't know anything. Remember that that's ego talking. That that's not that's not consultative skill or confidence talking. It's ego. 
right? Because you're afraid that if you don't have some answers or if you keep asking questions, you may not sound as skilled, right? If you're newer to this uh, industry, that may be your, your drunk monkey in the back of your head saying, oh my goodness, you don't have a lot of experience. And if you keep asking questions, it'll expose somehow that you don't have a lot of experience. Guys, I, 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 can, I can tell you, and there are people on this call who will confirm what I'm about to say, truly it's the exact opposite. The, the better you are at asking questions and the more consultative you can and will be, the more skilled you will seem, the more at ease they will feel with you, the more confidence they will, they will uh, give over to you, which then in turn makes you feel more confident and everybody wins. Questions is the key to life. It certainly is the key to a buyer consult. And so, so, uh, so just moving through the, the rest of these, I love what happens if we cannot find that specific feature, right? Let's have that conversation right now, right? What, what happens if we cannot find that specific feature? And I think that that question goes hand in hand with the question that Lisa asked. H how do you manage a conversation around a price range not encompassing some of the things that they are looking for, right? And so if you're starting to hear things, I had buyers once who were looking, they were, they were coming from um, Dallas, Fort Worth. And apparently in Dallas, Fort Worth, like three, four and uh, three or four car garages are kind of the norm. At least that's what I'm be, I, I was told, right? And so they kept looking for the houses that had three and four and five car garages. And I'm thinking, okay, right, let, let, let's address that, right? Unfortunately, for $600,000 in Norwalk, you can mostly expect one and two car garages. I'm curious, what is it that's driving the desire for uh, larger three or four car garage opportunities? Well, nothing, that's just what we're used to. We have only two cars, so if that's what's normal here, that's great. Okay, well, problem solved. Or, you know, we're collectors or we have six children and so there's always tons of cars and what, so now you're, you're, you're finding out what they need. Great, well, knowing that mostly in that six to 650 range locally, you'll be finding two car garage opportunities. I'm curious, would it make sense to explore properties that had a separate space for you to either build an extra garage or bring in one of those freestanding two car garage, you know, pop-up modular type things? but you get to have the conversation, right? So, so when you're starting to hear amenities that don't exist in that price range, I would address it using, so I'm curious, what, what would happen if we couldn't find that specific feature? You've said you're looking to, to concentrate your, uh, your search in Wilton and Weston for X, Y, and Z reasons. What would happen if we couldn't find a few of those features for that amount of money in those particular towns? And then you wait for the answer because the answer is, well, we'd either give that up or we're willing to spend more or maybe we need to be searching in different towns. But your question prompts the answer that prompts the next question to create a dialogue. instead of um, I had somebody one time who kept wondering why I wasn't showing him houses with indoor, not in ground, indoor pools in the 450 range in Norwalk. I thought, I, I am so sorry to, to ask me that again. <laughs> Well, you've shown me three houses and not, none of them had indoor pools. And I said, oh, you know what, I, I am so sorry that the indoor pool didn't come up in our consult. Is that something that's important to you? And he said, well, it most certainly is. And I said, well, you know what, let's, let's have a conversation around that. I'm curious, have you had an indoor pool in previous properties that you've owned? No, I understand. So uh, would it surprise you to know that an indoor pool is one of those amenities in Fairfield County that is really, really difficult to come by. There are not a ton of properties that have 
indoor pools. And mostly where we're going to find them are in those upper million, million and a half, maybe $2 million properties. And so I'm, so I'm curious, how important is that pool to you? Should we, should we abandon where we're searching and start searching in other places based on, on the in-ground pool, knowing that that likely will mean you'll need to spend three to four times as much money? Well, well no, I, I, this is the price range I have. Understood, understood. I'm curious, what, would it surprise you to know that, that in Norwalk in that 450 range, I, I'm not sure I have ever once come across a property with an indoor pool. You know, unfortunately, um, that may that may be outside of the realm of what is possible for this particular range in this particular town. Curious, is is buying in a town that has a great Y or a great town pool indoors another potential possibility for you? Why is having that indoor pool important? And he said to me at that moment, I swim. It is my main form of exercise and I swim year round. So I can't just have a pool outside. Great. Guess what? There are opportunities in some of our towns with great indoor pool opportunities that you don't have to own it. And then we got to have a conversation around how much more appealing that could be because you don't have to take care of it. You don't have to pay taxes on, on, the, on the indoor pool. Right. It, it's it, frankly, as a seller, that's a tougher sell once you're on the sell side, because there are very few people who find that actually appealing. Right. To have that indoor pool, it will skew your buyer pool. So we got to have this conversation about why it was such a, a massive benefit to him to buy in a town that had an indoor gym or town center or Y or whatever with an indoor pool. So, so that's, at least that's how I would, I would pivot that to a conversation around what happens if we can't find that specific feature, right? All right, guys, and so, so moving from the needs analysis, uh, you then are writing furiously and you get to then go back and ask them some questions around the things that they put on that piece of paper. I'm curious, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, we now need to take that information and distill it into your top five must have items. You do have that form in front of you. I'm curious based on all the things that you said were important to you, if you could only choose one of them, which one would it be? If you could choose one more, which one would it be? If you had a third opportunity, which one would it be? And we do that for one, two, three, four, and five, and we build them a top five must have list because the must haves are the things that they're not willing to negotiate on. You can see at the very top of that top five must have list form, it says there is no such thing as a 100% house. Let's agree that when we find a 90 to 95% house that includes your top five must haves, it'll prompt discussion about making an offer. Guys, I, I want you to be clear about why that's written that way. You are, you are communicating an expectation upfront in the consult that part of my job as the agent that you're hiring to assist in this is that when I see a property that meets your criteria, I'm going to ask you if you want to be writing an offer on it. And for too many of us, that question is something we never ask because we don't wanna be pushy. We wait, we wait around for them to say, oh, finally, this is the one. Well, what if, what if the one was actually three houses ago? What if the one was something you showed them last week and they're just of a behavioral style that they won't raise their hands and say, you know what, we want this one. Or they won't do it yet because they're relying on you to remind them that this house meets their criteria. Some of you will struggle with what I just said. I understand, I get it. 
I get it. Remember, that's just your natural behavioral style being a little bit uncomfortable, pushing out a question like, is this something that we should be making an offer on? That's why I encourage you to utilize a document like this and make sure that buyers understand right up front that part of my job once you hire me is when we walk into a house and it meets most of your needs, I'm going to bring that to your attention and ask you if you want to buy it. Because I'm going to tell you what, I've done it both ways. And when you step up, that doesn't mean every single house you walk into is something that they should buy. You've, you've got to understand their top five must-haves as well. You'll start to feel them out a little bit about what it is they gravitate towards, the style of house. However, when we do walk into one and we get to check off each of the top five must-haves, and they're kind of looking at each other and asking a bunch of questions and placing some furniture, which are, by the way, are all buyer signs. What else are buyer signs that we, we oftentimes misinterpret? I'll give you a hint. It's a word that starts with an O. And it ends with objections. Right? Objections. We misinterpret objections when people start saying, oh, you know what, I don't, I don't know if this bedroom is going to fit the, the, the master bedroom set that we have. Don't misinterpret that as we have to move on to the next house. You need to hear that for what it is. It's a buying sign. They're saying, you know what, this house is kind of awesome. And the only thing that I'm struggling with here is that the, the bedroom may be a little small based on the furniture we currently have. You need to start asking some questions. Hey, I'm curious. How attached are you to that bedroom set? <laughs> right? <laughs> Is it, are, are we finding a house for the bedroom set? Or are we finding a house for you and your family, knowing that maybe you could sell that bedroom set and reward yourself with a new one that fits when you move in? Right? These, these are things that oftentimes they get stuck on that if we can help them through making those decisions, Instead of hearing, oh, you know what? That bedroom set will be with me till my dying day. It was, you know, because that's sometimes what we hear when they say, oh, the bedroom is not big enough for my set. Great, I'm curious, have you noticed that this house has most of the rest of the things that you put on your, uh, on your, on your list? Would you, would you, I'm curious, would you agree that this is like a 90 to 95% house based on the things that were important to you? Yeah, and so I'm curious other than the fact that the, the master bedroom may not fit your current bedroom set. Is this a home you would make an offer on? Yeah, excellent. Let's see how we can troubleshoot the master bedroom issue. And here's why, because I'm concerned, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, that if you pass on this house because your current furniture doesn't fit into this room, you may find that you run into that issue over and over and over and over again. And now we're looking at houses that don't meet quite as many of your criteria as this one does that have that same issue. So what I'd like to do is just kind of talk through some, some ideas about solving that issue, which then just opens the door for you to purchase this one and or the next one. Do you see how this top five must have thing works? I don't want to beat the horse more dead than I need to. And when you work from a top five must have list after a valid buyer consult, do you see that after you go out once or twice, you'll start to understand them a little bit better. You'll start to know whether or not the things they put on this list actually belong there, right? I've already had people who build a top five must have list based on the things that they thought sh should be important to them only to walk them through you know, three or four houses. And at the end, I said to them, guys, you know what? It occurs to me that your top five must have list may be missing a couple of things. They're like, well, like what? Well, it, your top five must have list does not talk about the land at all. And yet every single house that we've, we've pulled up to, I have to like tie a rope around you to pull you in from the outside because you're so, you're so attracted to the property it almost seems like the property is more important than the house. And they sit back and they're like, hmm, you know what? 
That is totally right. And we don't have that on our top five must have list. All right, well, that's fine. The good news is, right, we wrote it in pencil. Pencils have erasers or pens can cross out and we can write something else in. However, if you're looking for X, Y, Z on land and that's going to take one of your slots, what are you sacrificing? What are you giving up? We don't get to, this isn't a top six must have list, right? It's a top five must have list. And so help them help themselves by modeling for them the, 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 the concept of sacrifice. If you have buyers who are unwilling to sacrifice on anything, you have buyers who will never find a house because they have this big long list down one arm and up the other and of all these things that they expect. You have to help, model, help them model for themselves the idea of sacrifice, walk them through an exercise of got it. So if we're going to, if we're going to put that on the list, which one comes off? Oh, I have to take something off? I don't want to take something off. I understand. And yet, again, as we've discussed, there is no such thing as a 100% house. And my concern is that if we start working from a top six must have, that that'll turn into a top seven, a top 12, a top 15. And now all of a sudden you're stuck because you're, you're setting expectations for yourself that the inventory won't meet. See how that works. Any questions on building and working with a top five must have list based on the script that we gave you? Nope, all making sense? Okay. Uh, one last thing. If you've shown them properties two weekends in a row and they haven't decided to purchase one, you need to have, a, you need to call them in 20 minutes earlier the next, that next weekend and have another console. Sit down and review the top five must have list. Hey guys, before we head, I just wanna make sure that nothing has changed. I wanna make sure we're all still on the same page. Based on the things that you saw in the last couple of weeks, do we need to make any adjustments or alterations to the top five must have list? I'm curious, based on the last four homes we've seen, if you had to choose one, gun to your head, you had to buy one of them, which one is in first place? I always want them to have the one that they would buy identified. And then when you bring them to another one, when you leave that house, the strategy is, okay, so remember, I asked you last week, gun to your head, which of those houses you would purchase. And you said it was the yellow one at 123 Main Street. So this one or 123 Main Street, if you had to buy one of them, which one do you buy? Nope, it's still 123 Main Street. Great, we move on from this one. Or maybe it's this one, ah, okay. What does this one have that 123 Main Street doesn't have? And they'll tell you. So I'm curious, does this one have enough of your top five must have amenities that you believe you should make an offer on? You need to keep asking that question, right? Many of you show properties and you never ask anybody if they wanna buy anything. J just as a reminder, that is actually the goal. <laughs> and, it's, and, 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 and don't mishear me, it's not just your goal, it's their goal. Their goal is to buy a property. So ask them each and every time, is this a property that you think you wanna purchase? I'm curious, what's missing? Where does it rank? Right, and when I say rank, I mean, is this the number one property? I know some people who like keep one, two, and three. I always found that to be confusing. I like them to keep the, the, the one they like the most. Which one, if you had to buy something I showed you today, which one was it? That one, great. And then I want you to compare every other house to that one house. Because what I have found is that when I've done that, sometimes two weeks later, now in this market, they might be SOL because things move so quickly. But two weeks later, when I have them compare everything to one, two, three Sycamore, the yellow house on Sycamore, they self-discover that, you know what? Each property we see doesn't compare to that, that house on Sycamore. Well, so let me ask you this. 
should we be going back and making an offer on one, two, three Sycamore, right? They figure it out because it, we, they just keep, keep putting that at the top of the list. I want I, that one the best, that one the best, that one the best. All right, the whole bunch of pages in your, uh, in your scripts that give you a whole ton of more questions to be asking, right? I'll let you go through those on your, um, on your own. Step three and step four, ed, uh, share your value proposition and educate your buyers. I'm also going to ask that you read on your own because some of you will use this information differently than others of you. I will tell you, and I, I don't think this has gotten any different um, in the last couple of years, buyers ultimately want one thing from you. What is the one thing they want from you? I'll give you a hint. It's not long conversation and lots of paperwork. So what is the one thing they want from you if it's not long conversation and, and paperwork? Hello? Hello, is this thing on? Hello? So they want you to uh, listen to them um, and then find them what, what they're looking for. So, so, so yes, and I'm going to, I'm going to expand on Stuart's answer and include, they want you to take them to see houses, right? They absolutely want you to listen to them and find them what they're looking for, but they want to go see houses. That's what buyers want. Buyers aren't interested in sitting in the office. Buyers aren't interested in top five must-have lists. Buyers aren't interested in big, long conversations, right? The consultation is massively important. It's important to them and to you. However, there is a reality that they don't think it's as important as it is. That doesn't mean you skip it. However, you do need to keep it to a minimum. And what I mean by that is, like, your consults, I believe, whether they're face-to-face -face or on Zoom, should be 20 to 30 minutes, period. And then answer questions, right? More than that, especially if, if you're meeting in the office to also then take them out that same day, they, they are just bored with the whole process after the first 15 minutes or so. Don't, don't think that's something you're doing wrong. Buyers want to be listened to, they want to be heard, but mostly what they want from you is they wanna go see houses. So let's streamline the process to get them out to see houses as quickly as we can. Again, please don't hear me saying you should shortcut the consult. I think we spent enough time in the beginning of this, this session where you understand that the consult is crazy important. You need to be doing a valid consult, but you can do one in 20 to 30 minutes longer if they ask questions, right? It does not have to be an hour to hour and 15 minute, you know, extravaganza about their, their needs. And so I say that to you because step three and step four in your scripts, share your value proposition and educate your buyers. I personally found, and I, and I, I worked with my buyer's agents on my team to also do this. And that is utilize this information as additional talking points in between houses. If you're not in the same car, you can, always, you can always be on the phone having this conversation. Or when you finish a house and, and you've asked whether or not this is something they want to make an offer on and they tell you no and they kind of give you the reasons why, great, let's move on. Hey, before, before we get back in the car and you know, we're actually running a little ahead of schedule. So I'm curious what you know about the process of buying a home. I'm curious what you know about building inspections. I'm curious, what do you know about radon? I'm curious, what do you know about uh, in-ground oil tanks? I'm curious, what do you, ha have you, have you, do you have any questions about the flow of the money through the transaction? I'm curious, do you have any, any concerns about writing the actual offer, right? All of these questions, which are covered for you in steps three and four, can be done not sitting in a conference room with people kind of tapping their fingers, hoping that they can get out to see a house soon. My point is, this is valid, important info. However, depending on who your buyers are and 
exactly what kind of connective conversations you feel they need. You can utilize all this information about educating them through the process, about asking more questions, about sharing your value proposition. You can do that peppered throughout your first couple of times with them instead of sitting in the office for another 30, 20 or 30 minutes going through this information. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you see why you would do that? Okay. I'm now staring at a bunch of blank screens in the top of Christine's hat. So I, I can't tell who's nodding their head or in agreement with me or anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, poor Christine, the, the, the burden of the the burden of the camera is now all on you. Oh, but there's Donna and a, and a Corgi. Sorry, Thanks, driving. I'm very happy you. to get that. All righty. So lastly, tonight, before we finish, I want to do this. I want to run through the close for the agreement script. And then I want to give you some homework between now and tomorrow. One of the attachments that Joe sent out earlier was a copy of the exclusive right to represent buyer contract. I want you to read that through cover to cover, line by line, word by word, and write down any questions you might have, because we'll go through it quickly. We usually spend a, a, a big, good chunk of time on that. We will not spend a huge chunk of time on that. There are also Forms 101 videos uh, that I've done uh, explaining that, that document in sometimes horrifying detail uh, that are on our YouTube, YouTube channel. So you can certainly check out those, uh, those videos for the real step-by-step. -step. But I want you to hear the script, then go home and, and well, well, you're at home, but then, then uh, spend some time between now and tomorrow at four, right, right, running through the buyer, consult, uh, the buyer contract itself, because then when we start in tomorrow, I wanna to just lay one on top of the other and, uh, and answer any questions you might have and then move into the anatomy of a buyer transaction. So that next step after you've done that needs analysis is going to be moving towards closing for the agreement. And that goes something like this. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, let's get down to the legalese portion of our meeting, shall we? As you know, it is Connecticut state law that you and I work under a written agreement of representation. After all that we have discussed today, can you see how it would benefit you to have somebody looking out for your best interests as you search for the best home and negotiate its purchase? That's kind of a, 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 an easy question because there's nobody who doesn't say yes to that, right? <laughs> People don't say, no, I don't see that that would be a benefit to me, right? So you get an easy yes on that, great. Now this form allows you to officially hire me so that we can move forward with finding a home for you. It outlines all of my duties and responsibilities to you, as well as yours back to me in this partnership. It also outlines how I get paid. Most of the time, my compensation is paid by the seller through the multiple listing service. So for all intents and purposes, you get to have my services for free. Woohoo! How does that sound? And they say it sounds awesome. Awesome. Now, there may be certain circumstances, such as my showing you a for sale by owner or a, a home that for some reason or another is offering little to no commission to the buyer's agent. In circumstances like those, you may be asked to pay for a portion of or the entire commission. However, we will always discuss those homes first prior to you seeing them so that you fully understand any financial obligations you may have should you choose to pursue those few exceptions. Remember, the good news is this, 98% of all homes that we see together will not require that conversation, and you'll always have ample notice of any homes that do. Furthermore, this document goes on to explain that at all times I must abide by both federal and state fair housing guidelines and rules, which means I may not be able to specifically answer some of your questions. However, I will always guide you to a resource that can. So if all that makes sense to you, all that's left to do is sign the contract and we are off to see our first property. I'm excited 
to go and take a home off the market with you. So you hear how the flow of that close for the agreement script goes, right? You're now going to uh, tonight or tomorrow read through the actual contract. Some of you have done that before, but I want you to do it again and see how the contract kind of fits into or this script kind of overlays the contract because it does a really good job of explaining kind of the basic detail of the contract, the, the, the different pieces of the contract without going line by line, word for word through the actual contract. And again, I'll answer any questions on that tomorrow. What are your thoughts or questions about when you hear that close for the agreement script? What are you hearing? Are you hearing something that is a useful tool? Are you hearing like terror? Are you hearing, I can't believe he actually brought up the commission and how it gets paid. T t talk to me about what your thoughts are and what you're hearing. Okay then. Very informative, Rick. Nothing in particular, just overall. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, I will tell you that for the most part, this document, not the actual contract, but the document you have in front of you with the script in front of you, allows you to not hide from this form. It allows you to not hide from how you get paid or that you get paid, or that you have an expectation that you'll get paid, all of which are actually quite important, right? Without having to literally go line by line, word for word through the document, right? And so there's a balancing act here. When I say have a complete buyer consult, it does not necessarily mean spending 45 minutes going over this buyer contract. That's why we gave you step number six. It's why we gave you the overlay, the, the, the contract in layman's terms. Here's what it is, here's what it does. And, you get, and they, you get to ask them, do you have any questions on that? If not, you'll initial here and sign here and we, we can be off, right? But you do allow them the opportunity to ask questions. All right, guys, that is where I am going to uh, pause for the evening uh, to make sure that you get uh, the opportunity to review the two of them and then ask any questions first thing tomorrow. Uh, as I said, we will start with that. Uh, I'll give you some, uh, some strategies for uh, moving forward with buyers right out of the gate, uh, as well as setting some, some, strat some uh, expectations for how long it's going to take them to find the house that they want to purchase. I'll give you some scripts for that, scripts that work really, really well. Uh, and then we'll move into the anatomy of a buyer transaction. Uh, Eric, you had a, uh, a question in the chat and I see that you have um, turned your camera on. So I'm assuming that, that those two things are related. Can you ask me your question though, instead of me reading it? Because I think you may be able to explain it uh, verbally better than I'm reading yeah, it. So I have this client, I've been, I've been like working for three, four weeks now with him uh, to find a unit. Uh, he can only put three and a half percent down and it needs to be an FHA loan. And we're trying to find a unit with a very small budget, talking 240 or even less. Uh, and everything I find on the HUD side all those condominiums or what, what they call it seem to have a, like an expiration date who's already passed. Um, so, and I have no, his, his question to me is like, what alternatives do we have then instead? Yeah. We'll so what, a, so a, what I would do, who, who's, um, who's writing his loan? I'm working with uh, Nancy Morgan. West Coast. Okay. So what I would do is I would, uh, I would get a hold of Nancy and see if Nancy can provide you with uh, a list of condo complexes that she knows are uh, FHA approved. This way, you don't necessarily have to be on the, uh, on the HUD site for a property. You can, you can pursue properties in complexes that, um, that we know on the back end are generally speaking FHA approved. Um, 
because there may be more, uh, more available to you on the general market than only searching through HUD. Uh, Nancy should be able to work either, either from her own data or if, she's, if she struggles with that, I know Karen, uh, Karen Mulreed has, um, has additional data, so uh, you can suggest that maybe she connects with Karen, but they should be able to give you, go here, 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 and here, and you know, what towns are you looking at? Okay, here are the condo complexes that we know are FHA approved on the back end, shop there, um, because that may, may open the, the floodgates, well, maybe not floodgates, but may open some additional opportunities and you won't have to worry because you already know from the mortgage side that the FHA won't be a problem. All right, thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Guys, any other questions? I know we have three and a half minutes. What else, anybody else have a question uh, we can ask? No? All righty. Well, as always, it's my pleasure to spend time with you. I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 